meeting of the Guam Election Commission to order. It is 4.23 p.m. Thursday, July 14th. And we're here at the Oka building at the Guam Election Commission office. Um, we've determined that there's quorum. President is myself, Jerry Sosimo, Vice Chair. Uh, Joe Mofnas, Democratic member. Benny Pinala, Republican member. And Patrick Seville, independent member. Legal counsel, Vince Camacho is also present. And Maria Pangolina, our executive director, is present. Case certification? Uh, published in the Guam Daily Post on July 7th and July 11th. Okay. Uh, we'll go to approval of agenda. Mr. Chair, I'd like to move to approve the agenda. Okay, motion to approve the agenda. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Uh, approval of the July 1st minutes. Give you time to review the minutes. Okay, there's a motion to approve the July 1st uh, meeting minutes, subject to corrections. Second. Second by uh, Commissioner Panala. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, let's move to correspondences. Um, Mr. Vice Chair, um, we didn't get very many, we didn't get any correspondence at this time. No correspondence? Yes. Okay, then we'll move to Executive Director's report. Mr. Vice Chair, uh, the election timeline starts on page eight. We are um, uh, we are up to date. Our um, Uokava and Off Island ballots went out uh, yesterday, um, and then we sent out two more today. So we're up to 89 ballots that have been sent out. Um, <coughs> we also. Um, are starting, we are printing uh, ballots as we speak. We will have the sample ballot up on our website and available in our office when, uh, after tonight's meeting. Um, and uh, district registration will start August 5th in 19 mayor's offices. Uh, we have a list of district, um, district voter registrars and the district voter registrar manual for your approval. Okay. Any questions on the on district, district registration? Registrar. All the all the district registrars have been filled, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. We have to approve the uh, the manual. And and the yes. The manual. The manual and the uh, listing of the district border register. Yeah, yes. this, this so okay. So go ahead and move to, to accept the uh, register menu and the uh, volunteer or district voter register. Uh, Mr. Vice Chair, may I ask for your approval? Should there be some dropouts that I can correct it? Um, on the uh, registrars? On the registrars. Okay. Subject to correction. So the, the motion is to approve <coughs> and accept the um, District voter registrar manual, as well as the um, listing of um, assigned district voter registrars, subject to um, any corrections or additions or deletions. Right? Okay. There's a motion. Second. Second. Motion, motion yeah. by Mr. Mafnes. Second by Mr. Panala. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed. Okay. Mr. Vice Ch Chair, yes. the um, precinct officials and poll maintenance workers. Um, we started going, we've been delivering our, um, our voting booths to our uh, 21 polling sites. We're not finished yet, um, but uh, we've, we've been passing off the poll maintenance workers um, application forms. And so um, <coughs> we don't have a list of poll maintenance workers yet. We will have it for the next meeting. Um, we ask that our precinct official training starts tomorrow July 15th, so with you, in front of you, you have our precinct official handbooks and the uh, precinct official list that we need your approval for. 
just for clarification, what, what is the role of the pole maintenance? Is that that's separate, I know, from the yes. precinct Thank official. Thank you. So pole maintenance workers, one of them is from the school, and where the big schools are, uh, we add one more. We want to make at least two of them work. They open the gates, they close the gates, they make sure the school, the air conditioners are working, the doors are um, working, the, I mean, the doors are closed or open depending on what school, and so, and they'll help us with distributing the, le the, d the meals to the precinct officials um, during the day. Um, and if, if. Um, and the bathroom. And <laughs> yes, the bathroom. So they're in charge of the facilities during the day, sir. Okay, any questions um, for Maria before we vote on the precinct official handbook as well as the uh, precinct official listing? Okay, there's a motion. Is there a motion to uh, approve the um, 2022 primary election precinct officials handbook as well as the um, 2022 primary election precinct officials subject to any corrections? Okay, Second. motion by um, Pat Bell, seconded by Benny Palala. All those in favor, say aye. aye. Okay, let's move on to the uh, Mr. Chair, yeah. before we move any further out, I'd just like to make a, a note in here, and I, I talked to Maria about this on the satellite, because it's still on the timeline, so w maybe we should eliminate that. Yes, thank you. Right. Yeah, th as recall in the last meeting, we um, did not um, entertain or approve the, s the three satellites the, for the three Saturdays of the early voting. Uh, I think with 30 days of early voting plus the election day, that's more than adequate time for the voters to cast their ballot I without agree. having to. Uh, our concern is, is logging those ballots every Saturday from their um, satellite destination back to the election commission. So yeah, we'll go ahead and remove that from the timeline, okay. Uh, item B. On page 31, you will see that there are 55,332 voters. That came, the 3,000, most of them came from our motor voter registration. And um, we were, we are caught up. Uh, we went, we, if you remember, the staff were busy scanning all those motor voter registrations that the application forms that we did not get. And so we now are from November 2020 to, to, uh, to February 2022. On page 32, you will see the additions of um, new registrants. Uh, the first column will show you that there were 4,812 from uh, starting in November all the way up to February, and then March, April, May, and June are the actual reports that we did. Um, we started scanning in February. We reported in March the 430. Your mic, sir. Maria, uh, what's the, the difference um, in totals between uh, 32 and 31? We have 55,332 as of June 25th. Mm -hmm. And then the 49,784 is that? Is that that's just motor voter registration? Mm -hmm. No. Yes. So th that's the total number of um, applications we receive from DMV. So from those, um, if you look the, the fifth column down, that many declined, 8,922 declined. Fifth column down. Decline, right? Yeah, okay. okay. So, yes, yeah. so 49,000 is the total number of driver's license, um, I, Guam ID applications. I get it. Okay. Okay. And the first column is how many new registrants we had 
from those that we file from those that we scanned starting in February but the February batch was from November 2020 to uh, February 2022. Okay. Okay. So the additional um, 3,000, just add 3,000, 123, that, that brings us up to date with all the um, yes. applications? From DMV, From yes. DMV, yeah. yes. Yeah. Maria, um, also in terms of the demands on on our staff in terms of time and uh, effort. Uh, how much how much of the motor voter registration does that put on our staff? So we were dedicated to that from the from February, and then up until maybe last week, we had six staff and our temps working on it all the time. Full we're time. Full time work and. Ah, full I'm time sorry. plus overtime. Since February? Yes. Okay. I, I, Mr. Chair, I, I think we need perhaps to have a look at, I think that's an incredible amount of our resources and the percentage of, of voters who are, who we get through the mo motor voter registration who actually vote is quite small. And I, I just wonder if that's worth the, the if that's a, a good investment of, of our budget and time and staff. You wanna, I, I think part of the, um, or a lot, a lot of the work in the last few months is due to the, the uh, issue with revenue tax, not um, timely submitting those applications to the election commission. Um, so that that aggravated the um, the workload for the staff, but I, I think absent that on a normal basis prior to that, I, what was the workload like? So we will dedicate right now, starting in June. I think we would have three full time employees working on this full time, starting in June, and that's you know that's still a lot, but. Um, uh, DMV uh, is, has stepped up a little bit more, uh, well, maybe a lot more, and we're getting the applications as they come in, and they have five days to submit it from the date they receive it, so they're being up to date, but, you know, um, Pat, it's, um, it's a, a matter of law that we do it, and um, it's since 2015, the law was uh, enacted in 2015. We were only able to start implementing the law in 2019, and we're still not fully implementing it because they have at DMV online uh, applications for driver's licenses that we haven't even touched. That started in October, but due to some technical difficulties at the up at that end, up at their end, we still don't catch it. So yes, you know, I'm con we were concerned with that. We know that our voters or, or our people of Guam have many, many other ways to, um, uh, to register. And I think a big point I wanna drive is that they can register online on our website. And that, that in and of itself is good we still need the connection to DMV, but we don't need to process motor voter from DMV. People can get on our website if they have a current driver's license or current uh, Guam ID, and they can register. We have them in the uh, uh, mayor's offices almost year round, and then we have volunteer registrars. So it's really convenient for anybody to register already without that all that time um, dedicated to motor voter. Okay. And it seems to, we, we have a way of tracking how many motor voter registers, registries uh, actually vote. Yes, yes we do. Um, Ken Paris, if you remember, got those. Yeah, yeah you guys got the reports then. So uh, am I correct, am I, my memory served me right, that it's a pretty disappointing number? That's correct. Okay. Um, and. Uh, you know, just to be, to have all the information 
our voter participation was very low <coughs> in the last two elections. Yeah, okay. M Maria, I, I'd ask that you keep tracking that. At some point then, maybe we can take that up and <coughs> report to the legislature that it, it's really not a, turning out to be an effective way of increasing uh, voter participation. Pat, I got word um, that on July 26th is our budget hearing. You all know that we haven't gotten our supplemental yet, and we all know that a lot of our overtime, normally it starts in June, but we have to start in February. So I, if, with your permission, I can put that as part of our budget, uh, as, bar, as part of the testimony. Yeah, but I, th I think we still need um, some data uh, for it. But, but I think the bulk of our new overall registration is from this motor voter. Uh, whether they show up to vote is another story, right? And, and the workload that we put into process, that was is, um, you know, a different game. But it's a concern to bring up. Uh, but I think it should be backed by, by some data. I, I think, too, um, Pat and Commissioners, I think, too, as maybe, you know, I'm, we're anxiously waiting, when we get access, full access to the DMV system, it'll be less labor intensive. And it'll be more, uh, we won't be spending that much more time with it as soon as we get full um, access to it. But even at this time, we don't have, uh, we, we don't have, uh, projected date of when we're going to be able to get get uh, full access. Okay, any other questions from the commissioners? Yeah, before we uh, <coughs> go any further, Maria, on this uh, presumed official, right, on the notes, what does the OD and NR stand for? Not registered or what? Yes, so NR is not registered, so when they come to uh, training, we will register them. OD is out of district, out of district. so we will, um, we will register them in the, we will have them fill out a registration form and we will transfer them to the correct district. So for example, on this one here <coughs> for Agat Gamboa, right, is OD out of district. So you're saying that he's not from Agat? Uh, no, I'm saying I <coughs> think with Gamboa, I think that person is registered somewhere else. Oh. Yes. Okay. So we're going to transfer that person to Agate. To Agate. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. I just have one okay. sure. thing to make sure we don't run into the same issue we did last year with precinct officials who don't, who we need to verify that they are a resident of, uh, because the challenges last year <laughs> were sort of crazy. So if we can vet them before the election to make sure that they are a resident of the village that they say they <laughs> are registered in so that we don't have these challenges and then calls to question those individuals. Yeah, so are you, we're vetting these as they apply and go through the training, right? That's correct. Yeah, okay. And you still, on these precinct officials, there's still some vacancies to fill um, across, okay. May I just make an, uh, an, you know, bringing that up, that's what Motor Voter did good on. Um, we, if you look at our list, um, the transfers, there's quite a bit. So what happens is when we get their application, we transfer them to the, re to the village of which they list as their residency. So that's one thing good for us. The other thing about Motor Voter, you know, uh, is that um, if Jerry Chrysostomo voted in when he was 18, he doesn't come into our office ever if he keeps voting, but he has to go up to driver's license to renew his driver's license every five years at the minimum. And so we get, up, we get our addresses, our residence address, addresses updated and our contact information updated. So that's one thing good. I just look forward to getting full access to the DMV. Good point. Excuse me. Uh, Maria, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm going back and forth. Uh, you know, I, I was looking at the Ino uh, precinct official, and there's quite a few vacant now, and there's no alternate. So are we going to 
assure us that, uh, are you going to assure us that we're going to fill that vacancy there that is not filling? Uh, or how, how is that going to work? We're, we're trying, sir. We are calling back the ones from, you know, a couple years ago and even up to four years ago. We have the list. Uh, we, we are working on it. Yeah, we just want to make sure that it's all covered up. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. Okay, any further questions? Okay, move to item D, the volunteer voter registrar. Or did we cover that already? No, no, that's on page 33, sir. Um, I think we grew just by a little bit. We are still doing volunteer voter registrar training. Mm -hmm. We will do it next week. Um, but um, just so you know, Volunteer registrars turn in their badges on August 5th. Yeah, August 5th, yeah. And then voters can register at the respective mayor's offices. Correct. Now, can they, um, can a voter register? Do they have to register at the village that they oh, are no. voting on? They can Anybody vote? can okay. register at any village. At any time, right? Um, because the the uh, district register, if I understand it correctly, is from four to eight, right? Well, uh, actually, on when district registration starts, there is always one uh, district registrar from the mayor's office. So, if that person is available before four o'clock, uh, the people can be registered there. Otherwise, they have to wait until four o'clock. Yeah, yeah, correct. They don't have. Is yeah. what I'm saying. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so they can register any time at the mayor's office during their office hours. Um, and then it's available after 4 to 8, right? Or they can, um, can they still register online? No. no. That stop, closes right? that on yeah. the 5th okay. with the volunteer of voter registrars. Okay. All right, let's go to item E. Monthly financial. We're getting low, we're, we're make doing our projections. We've been assured that come July 26, uh, I think that, I mean, it, I haven't re received official word that that's when uh, they're looking for a budget hearing for Guam Election Commission for fiscal year 23. But that's when, um, you know, uh, Senator, J the, our oversight chair will address the issue as well. I don't know if, um, you know, I'm I'm sorry. I haven't I haven't kept up with the um, session schedule, um, so I don't know if our supplemental bill is on you know on the next on the agenda for the next session. Okay, I just want to recognize that and turn the table over to Chairwoman Alice. We're 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 almost down here. Item E. We're actually on old business now. <laughs> Uh, that's how fast we move. <laughs> no. Can we just continue? Okay, we'll go to item old business. And the first on the um, agenda there is the executive director um, great realignment. I know we've uh, this has been on the agenda for a while. So did we get a Anything back from the Department of Administration? Yes, Mr. Uh, Chair. Uh, so if you recall, the board um, approved the above grade, grade, right? Yeah. The above grade uh, requirement for the executive director, the memo and the justification was sent to Department of Administration for the grade from ES to e, e, EP to ET. Um, and in your packet, um, there's a response dated July 11th from the Department of Administration head of HR and signed by the Director of Administration approving the above grade uh, move from EP to ET. And so, are there any questions with regard to? Okay. 
We just need to take a vote on it. Uh, so, yeah, so if you have any questions regarding that, and then I'll get into the actual uh, request for the vote. Yeah, any, um, any questions before we go, go into the... Okay, so Mr. Chair, I ask the commission to consider a motion to approve uh, the, G this is a GG1, uh, to uh, uh, in move the executive director salary grade from EP to ET, um, and this is provided in this GG1. Uh, I, I'll pass it. Yeah. The GG1 here. So this is the first uh, request for the GG1 just to move up to the grade. Okay, and so if you notice, the we're moving her from EP at her salary there to the equivalent of ET, which is uh, step eight at this mm -hmm. point in time. That is just to make her equal. So we're now we're moving her the grade. This is just to kind of make her equal, right? Just because there's no grade or step that um, currently exists. Right, so okay. we're putting her at the grade where she should be pursuant to the approval. And then the next step would be to take into consideration her performance evaluation and then I'd move her up based upon that performance evaluation. So we're doing it in two steps so it's clean on the record based upon the approval that we're moving her to the current grade of ET and then the board will now consider uh, once they approve that they will consider the step increase based upon her performance evaluation sorry this ET 8 step 8 right grade ET step 8 this is the closest to her current salary under the ET schedule, yes. Under the ET schedule. Correct. And I believe the schedule is there, so you can take a look at it. It should be right after. Is it not there? No, sorry. It's actually on the, the next one. Do you have a copy? So, I mean, just for the record, the current... Um, pay for the director is under EP, um, which is the 97, four, four, five, two. Four, five, two. Yeah. And okay. so we're now we're going to take a look at um, bringing her up because if you approve her to go to the ET um, and you look at step eight, that salary is 98,257. So that's the closest to her current rate. Without going below. Without going below, right. correct. Okay. okay. Did you need to see this? Are you okay? That's pretty much in line with what we had already discussed correct. previously. Yeah. Okay. So we need a we need a motion on the first one. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to uh, move a motion to move the salary grade from EP to ET for our executive director. That will be step eight. Okay, there's a motion on the floor. Is there a second on that motion? No second. Second by Commissioner Mopnes. Um, any discussion, further discussion? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Okay. And then okay. we need a second. Yes, so the next the thing is to, for, uh, for discussion of, for the commission, is to determine her step increase based upon her, um, her performance evaluation. So now that she's in T, how, what step do you want to increase her to? Or you can just keep her at the same level. Yeah. 
Do you and need she's a doing great sheet? An excellent job. She should just okay. remain the same. Yeah. So I'm gonna I'm gonna pass this down. It's blank on the GG1 until you guys determine and fill that in. So the the if you look on the executive pay plan uh, chart under ET, she is now based upon your previous approval under ET eight. Legal, what is the, um, of course it's different in the private sector, right? But what is the standard within the government of Guam? And then at this point in time, uh, I guess for edification purposes, is the Guam Election Commission has the authority oh. to determine, right, uh, up to what step they, and, and just for future reference, this ET8 would be a start. That's the starting. That, right. that would be the starting for anybody new in the event. No, 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 no. It's the starting for her. Okay. Because she's, uh, we remember we moved right. her from P to T okay. at the closest salary rate, uh, level, right? Which is ET8. So for Maria's purposes, mm -hmm. that's the starting point going forward. So what is, given her points and her performance review, like um, I think for merit, for classified employees, they, the highest they go is like 3.5% up or like a step up. What's the? Um yeah, so for unclassified, it's really going to be up to the discretion of the commission. And we don't have anything in law that speaks to unclassified in this position. Um, can having just, there's a cap. Well, the cap is step 13. Step 13. Okay. So she's at ET8. The cap for ET is 13, or 18, right? No, 13. So anywhere between step 8 and step 13, keeping in mind that you want room for growth, um, because, you know, if Maria survives. Room for growth or in the event. Yeah, because if we're going to go beyond step 13 now, then you have to change the grade again. Okay. Is there any, um, any um, source that we can con consult for what would be common in this situation or what other similar bodies have done? Or is it just, we just... You know, it? honestly, it's all over the place when it comes to the executive director or general management. It's really like, for example, with the, the Consolidated Commission on Utilities, it's their discretion, what they believe the market rate is for a general manager or a CFO. Um, but because we're using the executive pay plan scale, that's not what the CCU uses, right? So. According to the law, the Guam Election Commission has to use the executive pay plan. So there's no, nothing in the law that says you can only go one step up, two steps up. That's the discretion of the commission. But you must follow the pay plan. Yeah. So the question is, um, is this something that we should have the full, you know, all commissioners present to, um, to, I mean, we have quorum, we have more than quorum, but we're missing two commissioners. So it's up to the commissioners to decide whether to wait for the other two remaining members to return or to make that call. She comes, uh, Commissioner Kapitata comes back on July 15th, next week, or this weekend. So next week, I mean, I know that th we have been talking about this for a while, so Maria's been waiting to close it. But any other? And, and yeah. just for the record, 
any pay increases are not retroactive. So they're from the t date yeah. you um, That's correct. pass it. Mr. Chair, can we take a 10 minute recess? Sure. Do I, we just take a 10 minute recess? And the actual um, step adjustment for the executive director. So, does everybody have this chart? Uh, Jeremy can okay. And we'll make a, a recommendation. I know during recess we had discussed uh, the appropriate step, what's typically the average increase for an executive of this type. And uh, we'll share that once we get the chart uh, disseminated. So while you're waiting for the chart, I know um, Madam Chair asked the question on what's sort of the average uh, increase. So for the average increase between the steps is 3.5%. Um, and so generally with like an unclassified individual, they would go up a step or two steps if it's a promotion. Um, but again, um, since the executive director is an unclassified uh, individual and based upon what you guys feel she deserves based upon your evaluation, which was already made public, um, then you have the discretion as to um, what step to put her at. I mean, and, and legal counsel, we've been at this for several months now, just ensuring that we're going through the steps, we're going through the process and that things are being identified, I mean, um, dealt with fairly, correct? And okay. Yeah, that's correct. So yeah. that's why I recommended that we do it in this two-step process, yeah. is one, bring her to the grade, yeah. and then two, address the 
performance evaluation, and then you guys can determine her uh, inc or pay adjustment based upon that evaluation. So there's two separate um, records of how she got to where she is going. Okay. okay. Madam Chair, I'd like to move a motion to uh, address the executive director's um, pay increase based on her uh, evaluation. And I'm recommending that the commissioners uh, approve uh, the executive director's step increase to step 10 in the amount of 104,591. We need a second on that motion. Second. Seconded by um, Independent Commissioner Seville. All right. No discussion on the motion. Okay. All those in favor? Say aye. 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 All, right. All those opposed? All righty. The ayes have it. Maria, you are at ET step 10. Yes. Congratulations. Right, congratulations. This is Masi. Thank you. If you came early today, you would have gotten empanada. Our vice chair just handed it over to me, so we will proceed to, we're still under old business, um, 2022 Early Voting Center. Uh, Madam Chair, before you, you have the um, draft parking plan. Um, we just put it on top of the desk, uh, on the tables it says draft. Uh, what the staff and I, this, what the staff have put together is that um, we have, um, we've went, we've, We've gone through dressed the pictures. We've gone through the uh, parking structure of the um, Weston Resort. There are 20 slots in the lobby level. Those all will be used for accessible voting. There are um, 47 slots in 4A. So when you drive into the parking structure, that's the lobby level. You go half story down or just an incline down and that'll be uh, 4A. There are 47 slots that will be dedicated to our early voters. Um, we plan to have a golf cart or two golf carts, uh, one golf cart at the, late, at the least, to transport people up to the mezzanine level. So the, you know, uh, uh, we'll station the golf cart at 4A, uh, which, and then take them all the way up to the street level or mezzanine level where we can put them right in front um, to, right in front, and then we'll take them back down to 4A. Um, also, we have, with the help of Guam Visitors Bureau, we have access to the Lodi parking, which is about, which is one minute away or 380 yards according to Google Maps. And so we will have three um, uh, minivans there What's to transport voters if they care to, if they'd rather park there uh, to the mezzanine level again. And then we'll, right, we'll park them right there, right in front. We're gonna keep that for people, for, for the transportation for the golf courts and for the vans. Um, we will have visitor security officers directing traffic. That again is with the GVB. Um, we will have traffic control uh, folks or VSOs over on the entrance to the Weston property down at the parking lot and most important for us uh, for the accessible voting um, uh, line so accessible voting will take place um, not at the lobby side but on the, right at the entrance of the parking structure our office for the um, accessible voting will be directly inside you walk into that uh, the lobby and it's right there to the right 
So it's the easiest point of access for our staff, shortest amount of time from the office to the accessible voter. Just for visual purposes. When you come down the hill, you enter the Westin, right in front where there's this little awning, and then looking at it to the left, that's the mezzanine. That's where um, somebody wanted to, early voter comes in, they're not accessible, they go up there to vote, correct? Correct. So that parking area is for accessible only? No, ma'am, that's for our minivans and our golf carts. Okay, so everybody would have to drive down into the parking lot right. for A, uh -huh. all right, and park. Correct. And they can park anywhere, but there's gonna be about 40 slots, 47 slots identified for voting. Yes. Early voting in that area. Okay. Um, so that's on top. Now, I, I, I'm sorry, I, I missed it. When you, when you drive down the hill, as a rather than going, are we gonna have a bunch of cars going around where the valley usually is in that lobby area. They're gonna be parked there and then get into the golf cart and the golf cart goes up to the mezzanine for them to vote? No? No. Okay. The, the golf carts will be at 4A, which is down okay. from the lobby okay. level. So they'll go down there, they vote, they, the, okay. Now with regard to accessible, and, and there's a reason I'm going through this, right? Okay. So be patient with me. With regard to accessible, all right, we're not calling it curbside. This is accessible for individuals who have difficulty uh, uh, with their mobility, right? Um, when you drive in, in that lobby area, the covered area, there's gonna be 20 slots identified for accessible. People will park in there correct and we're going to mark it and then somebody our team will be stationed in the lobby area where, where you walk in and you're under the stairs or to the left of that near that playroom yeah, uh, near, yeah. near the playroom right across the playroom so across the playroom yes. okay yeah right and so and we have a team who's going to be watching are there cameras is it going to ring a bell so we'll have a team watching to ensure that people drive up there it's for accessible they can't get out of the car so they're not going to be waiting there for a long time for somebody to come out and service them correct correct there'll be somebody one of our staffers will be outside all the time and we're not going to allow accessible voting curbside like to just park on the side because no. it's full what happens if all 20 slots are full how do we do we have a plan to manage that yes so when you drive into the Westin property, there is enough room for the accessible voter line to be furthest right of the driveway. The so, valley part? No, even from the top of the hill. Like in the parking lot. Yeah. Oh, okay. The yeah. Lot so furthest right, even from the traffic light coming down, mm that we can queue or line up the accessible voters. Our okay. VSOs okay. will be able to direct people there. Okay. And we will have ample signage okay. on the side, okay? So the line, if there's, if there's a line, if there's a line, so they go there, drive down the driveway, they have to go around to where valet, and then that's where they'll queue. And then they'll come in and then as the slots uh, empty out, we will s we'll put slot them into the one of the 20 slots. Okay. I, I just want us to manage expectations, right? We want to make this as convenient as possible. Mm -hmm. We want people to be able to access early voting um, during the time that it, it's, it's available, right? So I, I, we do, I mean, We've already received heat about it being at the West End, but that's a procurement thing. <laughs> we don't have control over that, right? So I just want us to manage expectations. That being said, in my mind, I'm trying to visualize how this is gonna work. Make sure we have ample signage, draw it out, put an ad in the paper so people know, right? And are aware of what it is and how it is and where they, they need to go and, and so forth. 
right? Did uh, we in, we are planning to put signage um, even on route on Marine Corps Drive. Um, I think it's the uh, the security folks from Weston GPD and the VSOs. They suggested the signage begin. Uh, up north from Micronesian Mall, maybe a couple signs going down, and then coming up north from East West Center, and then down, I believe that's the, down, down the hill, we can have signage there too, a couple signs going down the hill until we get there. Then we will have good signage for Loti parking. Okay. All right. Any other? I had a question. Um, so I think the where the confusion made occur at the, at, on day one or day two is the parking in the bottom, the 47 slots. Um, because you have golf carts, right? That you don't want to have a line of people waiting for the golf carts or they can get in the elevator and get up, go up. So I think it's important to have staff um, directing or managing that flow. Because if you have, I guarantee that the first day or first two days, people are just going to rush over there. Uh, I mean, it's 30 days, so there's enough days to vote, but uh, as long as we have staff that is directing the movement of where, where uh, the voters are going to park and where do they go, because there, there'll be confusion with that with that uh, golf cart. And if you only have two, the golf carts can only take maybe four, unless you have the lo longer one, right? And they're going to wonder, I just came down, now you want me to go back up. Um. I think one of the things also we're, we're trying to fix is that um, we want to make sure there's good signage. Um, if you haven't seen the service elevator, that's the elevator that takes them up to the mezzanine level. Then we have the staircase right at the entrance to the side entrance. The staircase goes right up to the mezzanine level. So that's, the, that, that's why we're thinking well, you know, we have to get them up so that they know where they're going because they're not used to this. Uh, so uh, Weston is helping us with the signage inside the, the hotel, and we'll, you know, we're, we continue to work at that. Yeah, Maria, I do. I have a couple of comments, please. The, I, I feel there's, and I realize we are bound by procurement rules, but, uh, and I hope this works out, although I am doubtful about this and growing more so. When the Weston was awarded the contract, part of it was, the, the deal was, it had to be a single floor and it had to have adequate parking. My recollection is it was very clearly represented that on the upper level, there was adequate parking for people to drive in and, and, and vote. And, and there was some discussion that many, of they were, the way they were counting spaces, many of those spaces were bus spaces and you're actually counting a couple of cars so you'd have people backed up. Now we're getting a, a very different picture. We're having people down in the parking structure, which is a difficult structure to drive into. It's very narrow. Um, I don't know, golf carts is, is not adding to, con I mean, it, it's, if people are there, I guess it's helpful, but if you're thinking about whether to go there, that's not, a con that's not something that says, oh, well, that'll be convenient, I'll just take a golf cart. That's another step. And um, according to the Google online calculator, 380 yards is not a one minute walk unless you are you know, 17 and, and, and jogging. So it's more like a, you know, it's like a three and a half to five minute walk. And, and I just think those are all factors we need to, to be frank about. Yeah. So from, from the Loti parking, we will have three minivans. So that's, I'm sorry, I miss, I might have miscommunicated. So it's one minute ride from low T to the mezzanine level. Yeah. I, I mean, do we really think that's going to be attractive to voters to go someplace and take a minivan? 
to go vote. I, I wish, I, just, I, yeah, I just wish I knew. I, I'm just really concerned that this is, uh, and so everything we can do to make it convenient, we, we really need to do, and we have, it's a challenge. We already have the keys if, you know, our, our staff continue to go down and, and visualize it. If anyone else is interested, they can join us down there um, to look at it. Uh, we, have, we have taken, we took possession of it this week, or last week, I'm sorry. Okay. So as, as the number, as the, I see, two, Tumon is slowly starting to get more tourists, but it's quite noticeable now. Are we getting any indication from Weston management that that now we're going to be competing with with their hotel guests for space and access? We, yeah, we talked to them, Pat, from the very get go. We asked them if they really wanted us there, and every time I meet with them, I ask them the same question because of all my of all the requirements of early voting. They said they're okay with it. They're excited to have us and. As far as we can see, um, you know, what, we, what we're asking for, um, they've been accommodating, but, you know, I do, I, for me, it's like, I'm nervous about making sure that our early voters come out yeah. to vote and making it as convenient as possible. Yeah. Are they committed through no, the general, the Western? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, all right, thank you. GCIC did not have any reserved parking spaces for early voting. They had to close down a parking lane for the accessible voting. So I think in this case, Maria and her team has actually, because I walked through it with them, you're getting more uh, <laughs> access to the voters by having reserved spots. I mean, I was at the Westin today to look at it and they are making sure they're painting lines, they're make, uh, coning off areas. So I think it's going to, I mean, although the location in Tumon may not be in, it's, it is covered parking for 47 slots. You do have 20 reserve spots for accessible. You do have access to if there's overflow for access. So I think these guys have done a really good job in, because I was really concerned too, but you know, just think about what we had at GCIC, which was nothing close. They had to take an elevator, one elevator at GCIC up to the third floor. And so who knows where they parked. So, I mean, I think if you really compare the two, I think you actually have better access other than being in Tumon. Uh, you know, no doubt, no doubt the team has really done a, a, a good job at, at trying to make it as convenient and seamless as possible for our voters. Um, I have uh, two questions, Maria. There are 47 slots identified. Can the 48th, 49th person come and park anywhere there? It's not gonna be closed off to them. Absolutely. And they, and they also have, they've also taught us um, a, an alternate, um, alternate exit. So if you go all the way down you can yeah. exit through, from from the parking lot to the other side of the hotel. So if somebody wanted to park in, I think, what is it, 4B? So B is the level where all the elevators are. Yeah. Right, so I think 4B might by be the most bottom. There's an exit, no? 5B? Are there no? Oh, okay. Um, oh. The service elevator, is that going to be cleaned? Uh, yes, um, and okay. there'll be signage to that. That's good. Okay. I, I, I've taken the service elevator. We saw it. It's kind of slow. Mm -hmm. It needs to be cleaned. <laughs> okay. I, I have one question. Um, so the 47 slots, how, who controls that? I mean, I know they have guests, and nothing is going to stop a guest from, like, the military, right? They can just park wherever they want to park. And if it's only if it only says reserved for Guam Election Commission, and no and no security is watching it, um, you know, we just don't want the 47 slots to be filled by their guests, and it should be for the voters. 
we're, we're hoping to have the, uh, w the visual security officers help us with that. Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, we're, we're, we're planning and we, you know, we're haven't, we haven't talked with, we haven't finalized our plans yet. We've talked to them before that we probably have a couple station or at least one station in the parking structure. Uh, I just have two things. Maria, if we can, uh, let's see if we can track the uh, traffic, you know, uh, daily. You mm -hmm. know, what is it like? What is the flow like? You know, get an idea about, you know, if there's any issues that we need to be aware of. That's number one. The other two is I'd like to see if we can track the, the voters time from mm -hmm. the time that they park their car to the time they vote. You know, sure. uh, how long is that taking? You know, I'd be very interested to find out, you know, and if there's any way we can shave time or, you know, you know, do a better job, you know, to uh, make it more efficient or proficient, you know, the better. Okay. All right. Yeah, I think that was the that was the comment two years ago, right, was that um, they're very happy. It took them no more than 10, 12 minutes at the most. Their, their voters are very happy with that efficiency, so. I, I know Tuman, uh, Commissioner Sevilla is correct. Tuman is picking up. Um, the Weston is picking up. If you see the parking on the side, that goes all the way down to their to their lobby. So it's good for good for business. But we just want to be able to make sure that we manage. This goes up to what seven o'clock at night? Six o'clock, sir. Okay. Yeah, it would be interesting to you know compare data right uh, from the previous early voting to now. Uh, did we improve, you know, wh what is our report card going to be look like, right? So we have the daily counts from last year, last election. Yes, and, you know, what we also want to know is have we improved in, in our time management or, you know, is it taking longer? Those kind of issues, uh, again, those data points are, are good information for us to, to review. Well, for the, you know, um, if you remember from last election, um, curbside voting at that time that we had was most used and at that time it took them it took our staff 10 minutes to service them in and out the walk last time is longer than the walk this time so we may be able to uh, shave off a couple minutes in servicing the accessible voter thank you also we had you know pandemic restrictions you know that we had and guidelines that we had to follow this time around those restrictions have been lifted so uh, i expect that it's going to be a lot smoother but again worth looking at those data points you know and tracking any other discussions regarding early voter um early voting center mm, none Maria, are you just going to keep this on the, the agenda for the, okay. Uh, board resolution GEC 2022-01, relative to setting new electioneering perimeters, page 39. Yeah. Um, so, ma'am, this was, uh, we presented this at the last meeting and uh, the board decided to um, table it for this meeting. So let me know if you have any questions. Um, Ma'am, we took, um, you know, uh, we've been delivering voting booths and we've, uh, I think uh, DL Paris has a new um, principal. And so I think I'm, I'd like to, for the commissioners, I think you, uh, the chair and Colonel Moffness went through the sites and I think you look to closely look at um, uh, John F. Kennedy and DL Paris, do you remember? No. So um, I think I think I've talked to a couple more of you. Do we keep the holiday t the hospitality tents inside? Because I know at JFK we told them they can be inside, but they ended up being outside all the time anyways, right? We're inside. Okay. <laughs> The people were outside. The people were outside. Okay, outside. yeah. Because, yeah. you know, the yeah. fence. Yeah. So they want to be both outside with their signs and all this. Yeah. Yeah, waving. 
Yeah. So, so these these perimeters or parameters were are the same as last time. Okay. We have a motion to accept. Madam Chair, I'd like to move to accept the uh, relative to the election uh, per perimeters at various polling sites pursuant to 3GCA subsection 9112. We have a second. Second. Second it. Second by um, Commissioner um, Chris Ostomo. All right, all, uh, no discussion. All right, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? The ayes have it. Alrighty, so Maria, just get it uh, prepared for our signatures, right? Okay. Uh, item D, voter initiatives. Um. Hey, Madam Chair, at the last meeting, uh, we presented uh, the issue of unrelated issues with regard to the six initiatives submitted by um, Mr. Wakin Ken Leon Guerrero. The next step was then to for the GEC's legal counsel for us to provide a summary. We submitted a letter to Mr. Leon Guerrero requesting for more information other than just the questions itself. We did get a response um, by Mr. Leon Guerrero on July 6. So from that point in time, we actually went and did our analysis um, with regard to the individual initiatives. And that's in the memo dated July 12th before you. Um, did you want to just go through that one by one? Yes. Okay. So with regard to voter initiative number one, um, voter initiative number one seeks to amend, um, well actually seeks to remove the primary election for independent candidates. And so in order to do that, um, he, we would need to repeal certain sections of the election code, specifically 15404 to remove the primary election requirements for independent candidates. And so when we went to look at the impact to that, um, we basically found that by removing that uh, requirement for garnering a certain percentage for independent candidates and not uh, equating that with any requirements similar to that that the party candidates must achieve, then you're sort of discriminating against uh, party candidates. And so we wanted to ask um, the board to take a look at that and request um, additional information of how he, um, Mr. Leon Guerrero intends to address that issue because if we have to create a summary to say that um, he's going to remove the primary election for independent candidates and there's that discrimination issue, I think the board needs to be able to inform the voters as to the impact of this initiative with regard to, uh, I mean, that could incentivize any potential future candidate to run as an independent so they can bypass the required primary election under the party um, uh, banners, right? And so I don't believe that's his, his intent, but we don't know and I can't guess for him. And so we basically wanted to ask him how he would address that issue so that we can put it in the summary for the voters as to why he believes the independent candidates should not, be, should not meet a certain threshold like the party candidates would. 
Do you need a motion for that? Um, I uh, no, I just, if it's up for discussion, discussion. and if, uh, I don't need a motion, I just need instructions for us to, or Maria, to request for uh, Mr. Leon Guerrero to provide that um, information before we can even start drafting the summary. Madam Chair, if I may. Sure. Uh, first, thank, uh, thanks to Vince, our legal counsel, for putting together the memo. Uh, six, these six referenda proposals coming are, are challenging, um, uh, particularly given the tight, time, tight timelines is something that I guess Vince will probably be discussing next. But. Here's my, my concern at this stage, is I, I don't read the law as authorizing us to anticipate problems with the initiatives. The legislature say, has very clearly said that, that uh, the right of the people to, or voters to present something by referendum is an important right. And our duty, as I understand it, is to uh, provide a summary of what the what the proposal says not to anticipate problems with it but to say or at least at this stage is to say this is what the proposal says this is a fair statement of the proposal a fair summary and so I, I don't know that it's and, and it is a question really for for all of us is is it our duty to to think about things and say, well, to the proponent, no, what about this, what about that? I don't think we're the gatekeepers for that particular function. So that's my, yeah. that's my concern. Yeah, and I, and I think it's not that you're the gatekeepers, but I think the voters need to understand that before these petitions go out, what they really mean before they're signed because if you just put on the petition, um, I don't want a primary election for independence, not knowing that there is a threshold for the party, it's just informing the electorate of what the effect is now, because basically what I've looked at in the past is that if you're going to do an initiative and it's going to affect other sections of the law, um, it's the commission's, in my opinion, responsibility to inform the electorate that if this passes, there's other sections in which the commission has jurisdiction and oversight over which needs to be addressed. And so that's just where I'm coming from. It's not that this voter initiative is not going to pass, but I just think in order for us to provide that summary, it has to say independence will bypass the primary election. However, uh, this provision of law still applies to the parties. And so I think the electorate can make an informed decision as to whether they'll sign that petition, not because there's the independents are going to bypass it, but it could be because the party candidates still have to meet a certain threshold because it's part of the law that's still going to exist, notwithstanding that the independents don't have to go through that process. Okay. And but I just think it's important because it could be, it could have some, you know, disparate impact with regard to the ability of parties to pull in candidates because now I don't need to <laughs> run under a party banner because I don't have, I won't have a primary. So if it's the intent, then it may be the commission to say, hey, why don't we just get rid of the primary at all? But you know, that's again, this is just putting this out for the commission to think about. Um, if I may. The concerns that even though as we all know, the independents have been the poor stepchild of the voting process for many years. Um, the points that council brings up are all correct about the problems 
the potential problems and impact of this. But the law provides that at uh, 3 GCA 16504 for that, that uh, any voter or group of voters uh, uh, can present arguments for or against a referendum. All I'm saying is it's not our job to do that. The law, I, I don't read, I mean, I, I think I've read this fairly carefully. I don't see that the, the legislature has given us really uh, one task with respect to the analysis, and that's, that's to, to provide a, a, a neutral summary. And then there are other mechanisms for people to, in favor of the measure or against the measure, uh, to present their opinions and their views. And, and so that's, that, that would be my only thought on that. That's my thought on that is we shouldn't, I, I don't think we have the authority to require them to justify or answer our concerns about why you know, we may think their, their provision isn't a good provision. Madam Chair, could I ask a question? Marine, the, uh, so this is not the first time that we've had referendums or initiatives uh, presented, but how has it been handled in, in the past as far as analysis or requesting for additional, um, not clarification, but I guess additional information to support um, the intent of that initiative or referendum? Um, in, uh, so we went through the bingo um, initiative and when it came to us, it came very comprehensive. Uh, when, and when we got the marijuana um, legislative submission, again, that came very comprehensive where it had the actual verbiage for the proposed law uh, for the marijuana initiative as well as the bingo initiative. I mean, it was volumes like that, you know? So um, we sent it to our legal counsel. Uh, so we didn't, because, it, because I guess there was enough information, we didn't have to go back and ask. And the you know, legal counsel and I've been talking, the next step is to provide a summary. But the summary is from just that one page for six of them, where in the past we received volumes of information for one uh, initiative and volumes of information for one legislative submission. Uh, Maria, if I may, I, oh, sorry, oh, Pat, go ahead. I, I'd also point out that under 16507, uh, whenever any measure qualifies for a place on the ballot, the commission shall prepare an impartial analysis of the measure showing the effect of the measure on the existing law and the operation of the measure. That would give us an opportunity for exactly the, the points that Vince just raised. I think that would be imp an imp part of an impartial analysis that this is potentially discriminatory. But that comes after it qualifies for a place on the ballot. That's where the, what, um, and then we get, uh, and, um, and that analysis, our analysis, is printed in the ballot pamphlet between the title and the arguments for and against the measure. So, so we have that opportunity to voice this, but where the law says it happens is at the, after it's qualified to be placed on the ballot. Yeah, so my point is, is it enough for the commission to place to allow this, for this summary, if you believe it's sufficient for it to go out to the voters, because there's some initiatives here that violate the Organic Act. And, you know, I don't know if that's prudent to go put out initiatives that could potentially violate Agreed. federal law, um, because it seems to circumvent powers and authorities provided by Congress to like, for example, example, the legislature, which no one else has. And so, you know, I think th that's where we are at this point. 
is making the commission aware of the issues that can arise if we don't have enough information. Um, it's not that we're going to reject, um, and if you read our memo, we don't, with the exception of the two initiatives that would violate the Organic Act, we're not necessarily rejecting the initiatives, we're just asking for more information to provide a sufficient summary, because that summary is gonna go on the petition that's gonna be circulated, right? So, for, for instance, and this is one which uh, m myself in the office grappled with was with regard to changing the number of senatorial seats back to 21. Um, we didn't find any real issue with that because the organic tax says um, we can have up to 21. There was an initiative in 1996 which was put forth before the people. The people agreed to 15. And then now this proposal is to propose it back to 21. Um, but I think it's important that whoever is presenting this needs to, we, the commission needs to say, the organic tax says we have 21, the people voted to 15, why are we going back to 21? That's all, I, I think the people need to know why the proponent wants to change it, not that he cannot change it. And that putting that in the summary will at least inform the voters of the intent of that specific initiative. So that's what I was trying to do w with the memo, is try to just obtain more information, um, keeping you know in mind that based upon the timelines, there, we have to provide the summary by July 25th. And whatever summary you approve is what's gonna go on the petitions to be circulated. We know one of our deadlines is this Saturday. Or no. no, the twenty, the twenty fifth is when we have to provide the summary. Because then that's when they. Once you provide the summary, that's when they can start uh, issuing or circulating the petitions. Yes, correct. So, I mean, if you look at the initiatives that were presented yeah. in 1996, right? And so, like proposal C, which was, and, and just for the edification of, of the commission, so there was a voter, several voter initiatives that were presented to the commission at the time um, especially with the one with regard to moving from 21 senators to 15 members of the legislature. Um, for some reason, even though there was petitions circulated and they've gone through the process of circulating petitions, the 23rd Guam legislature passed public laws that put the initiatives on the ballot. So then we really didn't need there was no need for the, the petitions, right? But then some of the questions that were posed, um, like specifically spelled out what the proposals um, were going to do and what sections of the law were going to be repealed and how they were going to be, um, how the, the effect of the initiative would uh, end up being right for the, for the people. So I have those, if you want, want to take a look at those. That's for the 1996 uh, initiatives that were actually put on the ballot.
Madam Chair, could I, um, I, can I get the timeline again for these initiatives? The timeline from the time. So assuming that we um, agree with legal counsel's recommendations, I, I agree that more information should be required. That's just, I, as the commission of, of as commissioners of the Rom Election Commission, what we give out to the public has to be complete and comprehensive. Um, number one, but what is the the time frame, and are we going to meet this time frame? Given the fact that he has to get we approved this, he has to get thousands of signatures to be placed on the this is general election ballot, right? Yes. Yeah. So we have to provide the summary to him by July 25th so he can start circulating petitions. He has, so we had to work it backwards because based on the statute, he has 120 days to circulate petitions, but 120 days would be after the general election. Then we had to go back and backdate that further because we have UACAVA votes, which now those UACAVA votes have to be sent out 45 days before the general election. So that brings us to early October. Prior to that, the Guam Election Commission needs to certify every signature on the petition. So given the fact that if it's, I think it's 7,000. So assuming all six get on or must be vetted, that's 30 some thousand signatures that the Guam Election Commission would need to determine if it gets on the ballot. That's way more than any of the submissions for any candidate combined, right? So, and I asked Maria, take a week, right? And so now we're into the end of September before he has to submit um, petitions. Um, to start vetting. And so the timeline is very short, meaning he's only gonna have really August and September to start like collecting 5,000 yeah. signatures. Per initiative. Per initiative. And then, because we have to print the pamphlets 30 days before, which means we have to get arguments for and against before we print the pamphlets, because the pamphlets need to go out before the ballots go out. Right, 30 days before the ballots? Yeah, but our problem is the, the UOCAVA ballots yeah. have to go out. 45 before, days. Yeah, 45 days. So right. everything it needs to culminate by the end of September. So there's a lot of effort that needs to be done. I mean, our job will sort of end by July 25th and then it's up to him um, or the proponents to get the signatures but it's been a lot of work just to get to this point but I wanted to just make sure that the Guam Election Commission is not doing just haphazardly sending out initiatives because you know otherwise it becomes anyone can just submit a question and there's a lot of work on our side in order to proceed and that's why we conducted this analysis to make sure you understand what this these proposals or ballot measures may uh, impact legal counsel I put on the, your on our chat on the commissioners chat the timeline May I ask, um, it, it, it looks like he filed this June 21st, submitted it, I should say, submitted it June 21st. So we have 30 days to come up with the short title and summary and, oh, and because of the holiday, that's the 25th, yeah. July? Well, we had July 4th. Yeah, but you didn't, wouldn't count that holiday, would you? 
I know, but it's not, uh, it is, okay. So July, assuming July 25th. So this is the timeline for the, for this that I, that I presented. But he has 120 days from July 25th. From, yes. To get the, the signature. The signatures. Which takes them past the general election. Yes. That's what I just said. Yeah. Okay. So if you look at the schedule that I gave you, um, that's there. Okay. If you look, um, so there's generally two parts to any ballot measure introduction, right? One is the pre-certification, which is the process in which the Guam Election Commission vets the ballot measure and approves that to be the petitions to be circulated to the the voters, right? Then after that, there is the uh, initiative posting and certification, getting ready for the election. And so if you look towards the bottom there, 3GCA 16219, uh, sorry, 6 GAR 2106, um, it's 120 days before the, um, and then you know, that's Friday, November 18, when the proponent must submit that by, so again, that's after the general election. Um, and so we need to start bumping everything up. So it looks like the submission of petitions based upon the requirements um, is September 19. So he would have between July 25th and September 19 to collect signatures. If he wants to get on this election. If he wants to get it on the general election ballot. Yeah. Yeah. That conflicts with our requirement for UOCAVA. No, so in order for UOCAVA then, um, UACAVA, the votes need to get out by October. September 23rd. September 23rd. Yeah, so they won't have enough time to vet those signatures. How, realistically, how many days, I, I, assuming he comes up with the needed signatures, at least numerically, we don't, and you have to vet them, how many days are we looking at there? vet the signatures um, by that time uh, we're finished with the we're, we're printing ballots at that time I believe so about I don't know 30,000 signatures <coughs> a week seven, seven days Sorry. to vet the signatures 30,000 signatures Yeah, so, so he, can, he can submit them. He can submit them as he gets them, uh, as he gets them. So, uh, you know, I don't know. And, I, and I, had, I presume he'll be passing around six sets of signatures every time. He'll be six people, the same person can sign all six, sig all six petitions. So, I mean, I did not put on here when you must send the ballots for oh. printing. Yes. Oh, so, <laughs> so if you notice on our, on our timeline, we have um, ballot placement drawing on, see, I'm sorry. So that, that's our signal. When we have ballot placement drawing, we begin printing ballots that day. So what day would um, that be proposed? Uh, September 13th. So September 13th, if we start printing ballots then, then that means he needs to make sure that, that means everything needs to be vetted by the Guam Election Commission for the proposal ballots before that date. 
so Vince, so legal counsel, so September 13, everything's vetted, okay? The problem for us is I know the process of sending out the education pamphlet. That's a major task too. So that's sending out to 52,000 or 55,000 voters. That too is a problem because we have to solicit and we, we have to choose who's yeah. going to argue for and against. Before all this, I uh, uh, No, I just, I, I don't think, I, I think the uh, legal counsel's analysis and recommendations here are not unreasonable. Um, I think it's 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 needed for us to do our due diligence to uh, to the voters. Um, so, but given the you know the time frame is another story. But I, I think we should proceed in requesting for the additional information of the conflict with the Organic Act. Uh, but the ones that require at least additional information and justification, uh, we should proceed and send that to the um, uh, to the initiator. Of this, uh, of these petitions. Okay, and I think maybe we can work with the timeline and give him his timeline, and then it's up to him to figure out whether he, that's enough time for him to get the mm -hmm. petitions in, right? So at least he knows that. Um, yeah. I agree with Leo Council. I'm sorry, Leo Council. I just wanted to ask. Sure. So your recommendation here for um, initiatives two and four dismiss. Right, the proposed going to conflict with the organic act, or is that not doing our due diligence? We already know that it's going to come uh, be a conflict. So, yeah, my recommendation is to just notify um, the proponent that these ballot measures would violate the organic act. So it's different if he was changing Guam law, but he's trying to change federal law. And, you know, I don't think it's going to be at, to anyone's benefit that we try to proceed in trying to change the Organic Act, and it, you can't do it. Um, the Organic Act is very specific as to the authority of the legislature with regard to how they conduct their calendar. As a matter of fact, there was a public law, a US, United States public law, where it granted the legislature the authority to determine its own calendar because it used to be what he was proposing. Um, the Organic Act used to say they would meet for 60 days. That got changed in this public law and left the discretion up to the Guam legislature. And that's not something that anybody else has the authority to um, take away except for Congress. The same thing with regard to um, sovereign immunity, right? Congress, specifically in the Organic Act, gave the power of sovereign immunity as to whether the government can be sued or cannot be sued to the Guam legislature. And the Guam legislature is the one that can say, hey, government of Guam can be sued in certain instances, and so it's not up to anyone else other than the legislature um, to grant um, a waiver of that sovereign immunity um, to anybody, right? That's the jurisdiction of the legislature. All right. So with regard to two and four, I would uh, recommend that we just notify the proponent that these are not valid ballot measures because they would violate the Organic Act, which is a law that no one on Guam, the voters of Guam, do not have the opportunity to overturn. That's strictly a congressional act, right? The other ones, I guess, we just need more information if that's what the commissioners desire. I think, I think um, um, my co-chair here had indicated that um, we would proceed and ask Mr. Um, Leon Grell, the proponent or the, of 
these initiatives to p provide more information for the summary and inform him of um, initiatives two and four, right? So you yeah, proceed, you don't need a motion, just direction. Right. Okay. So the direction is um, what is stated here in the conclusion, request from the individual more information and then also inform him of the issue and or concerns with um, initiatives two and four. Madam Chair, may I ask a yes. question with the legal counsel? The um, re response to him is due July 25th. Yeah, so I think we need to get a letter out to him tomorrow asking yes. for that. Cause, yeah. I mean, he was pretty quick for the yeah, last for response, the last, yeah. so hopefully he can respond to this. Do the, do, do the commissioners need to meet to give our response for the 25th? I would like the commissioners to review the summary because that is a duty prescribed by law as the official summary. It's a, it does say that the legal counsel will draft it, but I sort of want the commission to review it before it goes on the official petitions. Is that going to require commission um, action? I would like it to for the record, right? Um, so if you want if I may recommend to recess to maybe the 24th. Um, if he gives us the information in time, I'm sure we can provide the summaries by the 24th. That's a Sunday. Oh, sorry. Okay, the 25th in the morning. We have till 5 p.m. on. Right. I will defer to you as to, or if you want us to do it the Friday before, but that's liberation. I mean, not I mean, yeah, not for me either. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. What, what's that? <laughs> yeah, that's it's up to you guys. Noon time on the 25th, if it's needed. Okay. Noon time, like 12 or 12? Yeah, yes. Maria can bring in Panada. Yes, you're in charge of that Panada. Um, and would noon or 11.30? They'll go with 11.30. 11.30? Yes. Maria, please remind me. Pat, are you okay with 11.30? Would you feel good to have a pen on? Okay. All right. Yeah. The deal breaker. Okay. Right the deal breaker right there, <laughs> you know? All right. 11.30? Yeah. That's fine. So, yeah, just remind me when we recess. All right. Yes. A after we finish most of our agenda here. So we're at um, any other discussion with regard to the voter initiatives? Maria's gonna, um, Maria and legal counsel will work together to get the uh, letters out to the individual, and uh, hopefully we get a response before then by the 25th. Uh, item eight, do we, new business? A new business. Uh, item nine, legal counsel report. No, okay. Um, no legal counsel report. Item 10, public comments. All right, um, if you could come to the front, sign in, state your name, and present your um, inquiry.
Thank you very much. Let me address the board. No, well, it's commission board. So I um, state your name. My name is Don Ed Kalani, and uh, I I realize that my my interest is it cannot be uh, on the agenda because it has to be announced in the, in the uh, from the previous meeting. So I sent a, a letter to Ms. Maria Pangalinen and the board to to uh, uh, to to. Be, sorry. Can you turn up the volume? Re regarding my uh, my interest in being a writing candidate in the primary, uh, the 2022 primary election. Is that better? Is that better? Is, is that better? Is that better? Try that. Okay, so uh, I understand according to the rules, I, I need to my. Um, I was requesting to be a writing candidate in the uh, twenty. Uh, uh, 2022 primary election. Uh, I didn't. I missed the uh, uh, qualifying. Uh, in the, in the I submitted my packet by about 31 signatures. So uh, my interest is to um, to address um, the the board commission and um, you know, r respectfully request that I'm uh, allowed to be a writing candidate. And I, I sent a letter to Mrs. Mrs. Maria Pangolin. And um, in the letter, I stated my name, uh, Donna Kalani, and I re requested uh, that uh, that if if I were allowed to be a writing candidate, if, if there are variations of that, uh, and it's uppercase, lowercase, whatever, that it be uh, it be acknowledged as accepted as me. But I don't know if this is a. Uh, if there's anything else I need to address, but well, that's pretty much what I wanted to address. Uh, I sent the letter on the 22nd, though. So um, this is Mr. Donat Kalani. You had sent a letter to the executive director requesting to be um, a write-in candidate. Yes, ma'am. And you're here to submit your names for us to accept? Or well, I sent a letter you uh, sent to Mrs. Right. Pangolin on the 22nd. And I realize it has to be announced in advance, so. Um, uh, we couldn't put it on the agenda, ma'am, because we had already published our agenda. Uh, understood, but he's here with public yes, comments. Yes. Is this some, we could, something we can address right here, public comment, legal? Yes, you can address him and um, direct the executive directors to how to respond. Okay, have we responded to Mr. Ed Kalani? Uh, no, ma'am. Okay. Because you have to address it. <laughs> I can wait to the next meeting. <laughs> okay. No, um, ma'am. Yes. Please say uh, the the request was for um, uh, variations of his name. I believe three, and it's all uh, within what we what the commission has traditionally accepted. So you can take a look at it for the next meeting okay. if you wish, and then you should be able to get back to them right away. So that we don't. You know, so that at our next meeting, what we'll do is we'll review your request. We'll take a look at the names that you've submitted, and then we will take action Perso um, based on what the executive director has shared with us, right? That these three names that you've submitted are acceptable, right? Uh, uh, yeah. Is it, is it only those? Th could I, should I send another uh, email with, with added variations? Um, the, the, the letter, I don't even add, have my first and last name. I don't know of anyone, I doubt it, but I don't know that anyone will add my middle initials. Would that be also accepted in, towards me? So we actually, I think we've made it a practice that we give um, um, individual write-ins uh, up to three. Oh. Correct? No? Have we? So how many did you want? Five. Four. 
What, what I, I, I forget our practice if it's I, been three or five. We, we keep addressing this. Uh, you know, it comes up every election cycle. I, I think what we, I may be wrong, but I think the last time this came up, we informed the candidates that under the statute, we have to be able to determine that the voter was voting for you. And there's not a magic formula for that. I mean, spelling and, and, and Kulani is not a name that I suppose people could misspell. But, yeah. So it's, if you're running for, as a run-in, if you are a run-in candidate, you, it's up to you to tell your supporters to make sure they, they write your name legibly enough for us to know they mean you. That's, yeah. Okay. So then basically we don't need to tell them you can submit three or five and these are the only things that we're going to accept. Okay. Legal counsel, yeah. is there anything in, in statute that indicates, aside from the petitions where you have to use your legal name, that speaks to us having to accept um, a certain number of names, go through that as a checklist, is, you know, on election night we see, you know, Donald at Kalani, Dan, Neil yeah. at Kalani, right? Yeah, I think the big key, and I think Commissioner Seville hit the nail on the head on this, is when you guys, because you guys have to look at every single write-in to determine what the intent of the voter was, you need to be able to distinguish that it was specifically for Mr. Equilani. The other thing, Mr. Equilani, that you need to really, really hone in is this is a party election. And so if you need to make sure the people voting for you are voting in the right party line. Yeah, yeah. Because, you, because you can't be counted if someone votes on the Democrat side and they, any, and they put you there, you need to sort of help the voter determine which side to put you on, right? Because only one side's gonna be counted. And crossover votes in this election, the votes are not counted or the ballot's spoiled. And so, you know, you have a, that's another factor that you need to consider um, when you campaign. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I, I believe I'm the only, uh, I would be the only uh, candidate that is either Don or Don Equilani, I think. There's no other Don and there's no other mis uh, Mr. Equilani. So hopefully that, that's to my advantage, hopefully. But thank you so much for addressing that. Appreciate it. Good luck. You're welcome. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. Maria, please be sure we appropriately respond to Mr. Ecolani. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, it is, yeah. That's public comments. So we are now at adjournment. We're not going to adjourn. We are going to recess. Um, we'll recess. Is, if we have no other discussions, um, the Guam Election Commission is going to recess until 11.30 a.m. July 25th, Monday, July 25th. We recess to the Guam Election Commission office, second floor at the Oka building, Tamuning Guam, GEC okay. conference room. All right. Thank you. So all those in Thank favor, you. aye. All those in favor? Aye. 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 We'll recess until then. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your sandwich with me. Oh,